Some statements emphasize one role more than the other. Jesus related to God except that he never need to repent or be born again. Why? Because he was the only one righteous that has ever walked this earth. When we see a plural in relation to God, we should view it as a plurality of roles or relationship to humanity, not a plurality of persons. The New Testament writers had no concept of the doctrine of Trinity, which was still far in the future. They came from a strict monotheistic Jewish background. One God was not an issue with them at all. And even Jewish people today is still, there is no problem. <laughs> they do not believe in a Trinitarian or this is why sometimes when you begin to talk to a Jewish person they don't even want to hear from you because they think all people are Trinitarians that are in the religious world they do not know of the fact that some people like us believe in one God and one God alone Sometimes when speaking to a Jewish, people of Jewish persuasion, uh, when they find out that you believe in only one God and that Jesus Christ is that one God manifested in flesh, they are blown away by it. Because they actually believe that most of the religious, well, all of the religious world is believe in Trinitarian aspect. Now, there are some things here that are done that again they like to use and the one is the baptism of Christ because number one they saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove number two they heard a voice saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased now when you have that happening you begin to say okay yeah that makes sense here we go, there's three, three different, <laughs> but it was not three persons, it was God manifested himself. Now, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, not a dove. It was the only thing they could use to describe what they saw. Number two, you cannot see a spirit but what God did was allow a form to be there so that we could grasp a hold of one of the hardest things for people to grasp a hold of is something they cannot see that's why Hebrew describes faith as being hope for something that is unseen we as humans all like to see. You don't go and say, oh, I'll buy that Mercedes. I heard about it. I think I'll buy it and, and without going and seeing it. You go home, you look under the hood, you check out the transmission, you, you, the gearbox, you check underneath it to make sure there's no holes in the floor. You, you look for dents and scratches. You do all that. Stuff. You won't buy something that you haven't seen. Matter of fact, when you buy something off the internet today and it comes to your house and it's got a big dent in it, you send it back. You won't want it because you haven't seen it. That's what human nature is. We like to see everything so that we can explain it to somebody else. When you, when you purchase something and it's so nice, you, 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 you might not have it with you, but you try to explain it to every one of your friends because you think you've got this great deal. and every, We like to explain things, and the only way we can explain them is if we touch them or we see them. Senses. Yeah. We, we as humans like to trust our senses. That's why... When the time comes that you are really living by faith is when you don't feel God, but yet you still love him as if you did feel him. When you don't feel God and yet you go to church and you still raise your hands and you worship him. When you don't feel God, yet you get up every morning and you pray and you read his word. When you don't feel God and you live for him. 
That's living by faith. Because you know what? You know God is there. You know God is real. And whether you feel him or not, you're going to worship him anyhow. Live for him anyhow. Uh, Luke 3, 22 adds the further information that the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. He could not and did not sacrifice his omnipresence on earth because there is one of God's basic attributes. The physical body of Jesus was not omnipresent, but his spirit was. It was not at all difficult for the spirit of Jesus to speak from heaven, to send a manifestation of his spirit in the form of a dove, even while his human body was in the Jordan River. That's what happened. He was not baptized for the remission of sins as we are because he was sinner. Instead, the Bible says he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. We look at it and say we are baptized like he is because of his example. But we are baptized into Christ for remission of our sins. But when you understand and you read the custom of the Jewish people and about their rituals in um, rites of, oh, I'm trying to think of the right word, not passage, but rites of, he was going to become a teacher, he was going to become a rabbi, he was going to become, and in order, he had the rites of purification to fulfill that office. So he had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He, that's why he said in, in, in the word he said I have not come to destroy the law but rather to fulfill the law and so he made that statement instead the Bible said he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness when he made that statement to John he said I am going to follow all of the rights of becoming a minister And so he didn't come and say, no, no, I don't have to do that. He, he, he fulfilled them all. Why did he fulfill all the rights of being a minister to the Jewish people? Why do you think? Why? He couldn't, he can't it. Yeah. If he did not fulfill all the rights, the people would never have listened to him. They would never accept him as a teacher or as a rabbi, master. They wouldn't do it. Even though they didn't see him obey the rights of the law, they know he must have fulfilled them in order to sit in the temple and minister in such a manner. Now, I don't know if they, <laughs> if they had a, a roll book that was there and they said, oh yeah, he was baptized on such and such a day or whatever. I don't know if they had that in the temple or what. But, you know, he did it to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, he made himself known to Israel in that form by doing it. He made it clear what his objective was by doing it. He was separating himself from being what? Because he was known for being what? A carpenter's son. He was known as a carpenter. When he did this, he was separating himself from his old way of life to what he was going to do from then on. You don't read where he went back and ever put two pieces of wood together again. He was done. So he was fulfilling all of this. It was a public declaration of who he was and what he came to do. Clear, John 1, 32, 34 clearly states that the dove was assigned for the benefit of John the Baptist. Since John was the forerunner of Jehovah, Isaiah 43, he needed to know that Jesus was really Jehovah come in the flesh. Now we know John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We know he made that statement. And we know that in God doing this, he confirmed it with him. But later on, we see where John is in prison. And he sends out to his disciples and yeah. says to them, 
Are you the one or, or do we look for another? It, but you've got to think now. John is in a circumstance he can't control. And here he is under Herod's judgment. And he even begins to question his own. And all he wants from Jesus is a confirmation, yes, this is the right way. And he's willing to accept it. And we know that that's the way because what was Jesus' answer? He said, go tell John that people are healed, they're delivered, all that. Yeah. He, was, he was giving John the answer, the encouragement that he needed to face what he was facing. Because John had even said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So the form of the dove was a sign for John so that he knew that that was. And the Old Testament scripture refers to it. Uh, the dove also is a type of anointing to signify the beginning of Christ's ministry. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil and that God had chosen them. Priests in particular were both washed in water and anointed with oil, as, as I already explained. The oil symbolizes God's spirit. In fact, the Hebrew word Messiah, Christ, in Greek means the anointed one. And since Jesus was God himself a sinless man by anointing by a, and anointing by a sinful human and anointing with symbolic oil was not enough. Not by symbolic oil, but by the spirit of God in the form of a dove. It came from heaven. The voice came from heaven for the benefit of the people. The people around heard the voice. They knew. Was, because in that very next verse you find out that many people stopped following John and started following Jesus from that day on. And so it was given for the benefit of the people. But baptism Jesus does not teach us that God is three persons but only reveals the omnipresent God and humanity and the Son of God. So we see here the reason why it was done. Three times in the life of Jesus, a voice came from heaven as baptism, at his transfiguration, and after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Each of the three cases, the voice was not for the benefit of Jesus, but for the benefit of others. And it came for a specific purpose. We also see that in uh, Saul's vision. Saul heard the voice. The people saw a bright light, but they didn't hear or understand anything else. Now the prayers of Christ. Jesus prayed in his humanity, not in his deity, as we've already stated. What is then the explanation of the prayers of Christ? It can only be that the man of Jesus prayed to the eternal spirit of God. Did God did not need help, only the man did. So that's why Jesus prayed in the garden. He said, not my will, or not my human will, but thy will be done. Or he submitted his human will to the Spirit. And as he did that, he received strength from the Spirit of God. Jesus had two perfect and complete natures, humanity and deity. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was not one person of the God of being deserted by another, but the man feeling the wrath and judgment of God upon the sins of humanity. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There were not two sons, a divine son and a human son, but there were two natures, deity and humanity, joined in one person. He had taken the place of sinful humans on the cross and was suffering the full punishment for sin. On the cross, he tasted death for every person. This death was more than physical death. It also involved spiritual death, which is separation from God. And physical death is horrendous, but spiritual death is twice as horrendous. Jesus tasted ultimate death, the separation from God that a sinner will feel in the lake of fire. He felt an anguish, hopeless, and despair as if he were a person eternally forsaken by God. That's why he cried out. He felt what it would be like to be lost. Now, my wife was telling me a story 
the other day that she read on Facebook about how this doctor felt to pray for a man who'd been dead, laying on a gurney. And went over and prayed for him, and the other doctor came by and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm he said I want you to shock this man one more time. He said, no, we can't. We've already declared him dead. No, he said, I'm telling you, shock him. And the doctor argued with him again. He said, listen, for me, will you please just shock him one more time? And the doctor said, okay, grab the paddles, come over, shock the body, and all at instant, he had a heartbeat. Within a day, he was awake, never damaged his brain, nothing. And the doctor who had prayed for him came in and began to talk to him. And the man looked at him and he said, I am so thankful that you prayed for me. And the doctor said, why is that? He said, because I was in darkness. He said, I was hopeless. I had this hopelessness and such deep despair that I did not know how I could ever get away from it. I was dead away from God. And this is a man that's waking up who had been dead for several minutes waking up and explaining what it was like. We won't know it unless we feel it, but I don't want to feel it. I want to feel the love of God and be in the presence of our Savior. Some people believe that the Bible describes transfers of knowledge between distinct persons and God. This is a danger because it implies there could be one person to God who knows something another person does not know. This would refute the Trinitarian doctrine completely because they believe in its three persons co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. In other words, whatever one feels or whatever one hears or whatever one sees, they all. Romans 8, 26, 27 says, The Spirit itself maketh the intercession for us, and he that searches the heart knoweth that what is the mind of the Spirit. These statements indicate only a plurality of functions of the Spirit. On the one hand, God places His Spirit in our hearts, teaches us to pray and to pray through us. On the other hand, God hears our prayers, searches and knows our hearts and understands the prayers. So, it's duality or different purposes. Uh, I'm watching the time. Matthew 28, 19. A lot of people believe in the pre-existence of Jesus and I've already described that because that could not be because he was what? Born at Bethlehem. So when when it comes to pre existence, I don't believe it. Well not one not for the slightest. I don't even know if I'm gonna get to through page chapter eight. Let me try it. The son sent from the father. The word sent does not imply pre existence of the son or pre existence of the man. John one and six states that John the Baptist was a man sent from God and we know he did not pre exist his conception. Instead the word sent indicates that God appointed the son for a special purpose. God sent me from Canada to Scotland. That does not help me understand. That does not mean a pre existence. It just <laughs> Come on. Love between persons, a popular physical argument for the Trinity is based on the fact that God is love. The basic argument is how could God be love and show love before he created the world unless God was a plural person that had love one for another. Really. Other distinctions between Father and Son. Many verses of Scripture distinguish between the Father and Son in power, greatness, and knowledge. However, it is a great mistake to use them to show two persons in the God. If a distinction exists between Father and Son as person of God, then the Son is subordinate or inferior to the Father in deity. This would mean the Son is not fully God because by definition God is subject to no one. Jesus made the statement in Matthew 20, 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And implying that the Father gave him his power. Jesus said, My Father is greater than I. Humanity, deity. Uh, in John 1 and 1, uh, it says the word was with God, but then goes on to say the word was God. Two witness, I am not alone, but I am my Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself and the Father that sent me.
A number of times Jesus refers to the Father and Himself in the plural. These passages are in the book of John, the New Testament writer, who more than any other identify Jesus, God, and the Father. It's wrong for anyone to suppose this plural usage to mean that Jesus is a different person than God from the Father. However, it does indicate a distinction between the deity, Father, and humanity, Son of Jesus Christ. He, how was the Father with Jesus? The explanation is this. He was in Jesus. We know that. There is no biblical record of a conversation between two persons of God, but there are many representations of communion between God and the man, Christ. Just as God seeks communion with all people, for example, the prayers of Christ portray the man seeking help from the eternal Spirit of God. In John 14 and 16, Jesus promised to send another comforter. In verse 26, he defined the comforter as the Holy Ghost. Does this imply that the Holy Ghost is another person? No, it's clear from the context that the Holy Ghost is simply Jesus, another form or manifestation. According to John 17, 21 to 22, Christians should be one with each other just as Jesus was one with the fire. It's not this, this destroy our belief that Jesus is the Father. No, in this passage, Jesus spoke as a man, as the Son. This is evident because he was praying to the Father, and God does not need to pray. Now, how, how unite two Christians are, one could not say, if you have seen me, you have seen my friend. In conclusion, there is no presentation of persons and Godhead in the gospel. The gospel do not teach the doctrine of the Trinity, but simply teach that Jesus, both human and divine flesh, Spirit, Son of God, and Father incarnate. Any questions? We've got two minutes left. Okay. Um, so, um, at the moment, I know that the Jewish people are still waiting for their Messiah. Right. Um, do they think of him as, obviously, their Savior, but yeah. do they have the revelation that he is God manifested in the flesh? Or not at all? No. Yeah, they think of him as a king that will save them. Yeah, they still think of their, 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 their Messiah is going to come and set up his throne on the earth. And when Jesus comes and sets up his throne, then they're going to know the one whom they have pierced. Never. No, they're still looking for their Messiah. And, no, but I mean, like, do they think the Messiah is God? Yeah. They save them. They do. They have that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you will have an exam at the end, but I still haven't received any... Yes, um, what, like, what email address? Huh? What email address? Just the same one, Subeek at Hotmail. Subeek, S-U-E-B-E-E-K, 01, the number 01, at Hotmail.com. Okay? I'll send you one right now. <laughs> and the rest I will send during the week. All right. Okay, you, you do that. And, you know, whoever's teaching your next four or five classes, but I'll have the exam ready for you for the end. Okay? Okay. All right. You have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. you got a break time.